Hi, my name is Bella and welcome to my final immunology project where today I'm going to be discussing pneumonia, specifically bacterial versus viral pneumonia. So pneumonia is an acute inflammatory response that is centered in the lungs, which results in the formation of fluid in the alveoli. The alveoli is responsible for the exchange of carbon dioxide for oxygen in the lungs. So as you can see down here, B shows a normal alveoli, which doesn't have any fluid in it, whereas in C, you can see that the alveoli has fluid in it. And this is from, this is the result of streptococcus pneumoniae, as I will discuss later. So obviously, you can see how having pneumonia can greatly impact your ability to breathe. The fluid that forms as a result of the pneumonia infection occurs because of the abundance of blood elements, leukocytes, and opsonins present in the alveoli to attack the infection. And leukocytes are white blood cells, and the most common type of white blood cell is our neutrophils, and they help to phagocytose bacteria or virally infected cells. And um, I will talk about phagocytosis a little bit um, later, but Basically, neutrophils help to prevent bacteria or virally infected cells from being able to go off and infect healthy cells, so helping to, spread, helping to stop spread the infection. And opsonins aid leukocytes in being able to phagocytose bacteria or virally infected cells. Next, I'm going to show the neutrophils at the site of infection to attack the pneumonia bacteria. So I will show a video. So right here is the neutrophil, and the pill-shaped structures are the pneumonia bacteria. So as you can see, the neutrophil is able to phagocytose the bacteria, and phagocytosis is basically when leukocytes are able to engulf microbes such as the pneumonia bacteria. So as we discussed earlier, one of the most common symptoms of pneumonia is difficulty breathing, which makes sense given the fact that the, in the pneumonia infection is centered in the alveoli. Some other symptoms of pneumonia are fatigue, coughing and or chest pain from coughing, fever, low blood oxygen levels, which also makes sense given the fact it's in the alveoli, and chills. Next, I'm going to talk about some of the diagnostic tools that are used in order to diagnose pneumonia. So the first one is chest x-rays, which is actually shown to the right, and you can see the arrows pointing to this white space, which, is, which shows the presence of fluid as a result of the pneumonia infection. Blood tests are also used to determine the presence of infection, and you can actually determine the presence of infection by looking at the abundance of white blood cells in the blood. So for example, if you were to have an overabundance of neutrophils present in the blood, then this definitely can show that there's an infection present and there's pulse oximetry, which shows the measure of blood oxygen levels and as we talked about previously, um, the alveoli is the place where there's the exchange of carbon dioxide for oxygen. So obviously, if your blood oxygen levels are very low, then this shows that this process in the alveoli likely isn't taking place as efficiently. The sputum test involves taking a sample of fluid in the lungs after a patient coughs to determine the type of infection. So whether it is bacterial or viral, and then from that they can determine what specific bacteria or virus is causing the pneumonia. There's also a, the CT scan, which is a chest scan to get a detailed picture of the lungs, and it is more detailed than what a chest x-ray would show. The pleural fluid culture, like, pulsa, like the sputum test, takes a sample of fluid from the lungs, but they do this by putting a needle between the ribs specifically the pleural area, which is a part of the lung lining, and the fluid taken from the lungs can be used to determine what type of pathogen is causing the pneumonia. Now I want to talk about the different types of pneumonia. So the most common types of pneumonia are bacterial pneumonia and viral pneumonia. 
There are different types of pneumonia that can arise as well. For example, if you work in a in an environment that has a lot of smoke or chemicals, then you can get something called chemical pneumonia. But for this presentation, I'm just going to focus on bacterial and viral pneumonia because those are the most common. The most common type of bacterial pneumonia is Streptococcus pneumoniae, which as shown below is a round bacteria that grows in chains and it is the most common community acquired pneumonia. Some other types of bacterial pneumonia are Staphylococcus aureus, Group A, Streptococcus, Krebsiella, Pneumoniae, and Haemophilus influenza. For the types of viral pneumonia, the most common type of viral pneumonia is the influenza virus. There is also the respiratory syncytial virus, also known as RSV, which tends to affect younger children more so than adults. There's the parainfluenza virus, the measles virus, and as we've seen within the last year and a half, the coronavirus tends to be a major source of pneumonia. And as you can see below, I have a diagram of the influenza virus. The, what you see in blue is the neuraminidase, in red, the hemagglutinin, in green, the RNA, and in beige is the capsid that encapsulates the RNA. So now we're going to talk about the similarities and differences between bacterial pneumonia and viral pneumonia using pathogens that most commonly cause bacterial or viral pneumonia. So the most common pathogens, as I stated earlier, that cause bacterial pneumonia are, is Streptococcus pneumoniae, and the most common pathogen that causes viral pneumonia is influenza. One of the largest differences between bacterial and viral infections is that bacteria, like Streptococcus pneumoniae, do not have to infect host cells before starting to spread infection, whereas viruses do. Viruses do this by hijacking the machinery of a host cell and replicating its viral genome in the nucleus of the cell that it's trying to infect, which allows for virally infected cells to continue infecting other cells. Some traits of Streptococcus pneumoniae that are specific to that bacteria are that Streptococcus pneumoniae is actually usually a very harmless bacteria that resides in the nasopharynx. And the nasopharynx, in case you don't know, is actually where you would get a COVID test in. So there's something called a nasopharyngeal swab. If you've ever had like a very deep COVID test that's like very deep in your nose, then that's likely a nasopharyngeal swab. Also, Streptococcus pneumoniae specifically produces the IgA protease and pneumolysin toxins, which I intend to talk about a little bit more later. Um, for influenza, it does not release toxins because viruses don't release toxins. Some similarities between Streptococcus pneumoniae and influenza is that these pathogens usually enter through the respiratory tract, usually through the inhalation of droplets in the air. For example, if somebody with either one of these infections were to cough, then you can inhale that and then therefore get streptococcus, pneumonia, or influenza, and if it progresses enough, eventually get pneumonia. Also, if you touch your mouth and nose a lot, then this can be a major source of these pathogens. Also, streptococcus, pneumonia, and influenza both activate the complement system. Now I'm going to talk about the ways in which streptococcus, pneumonia, and influenza are able to evade the innate and adaptive immune systems. So Streptococcus pneumoniae, as I stated earlier, produces toxins like IgA protease and pneumolysin. IgA protease has a major effect on the functionality of the adaptive immune system because IgA protease destroys antibodies with IgA isotypes. This has a major effect on the adaptive immune system because antibodies with IgA isotypes are centered in the mucosa, which is precisely where the lungs are located. And the responsibility of IgA isotypes are to neutralize bacteria or other pathogens in the mucosa by binding to them, which prevents these microbes from being able to go off and infect healthy cells. So by the IgA being able to destroy antibodies with the IgA isotypes, then 
This enables the streptococcus pneumoniae to spread much more easily than if IgA was in abundance. For the pneumolysin toxins, it was shown in an in vitro study that PLY, which is pneumolysin, inhibited, inhibited polymorphonuclear leukocytes by interfering with opsonization, reducing respiratory burst response, and decreasing leukocyte migratory ability, which was found in Anishimoto, Roche, and to a man in 2020 study. So basically, pneumolysin activates complement but is able to divert opsonization and phagocytosis for, um, by, for example, neutrophils. So basically being able to evade the innate immune system. The strategy that influenza employs to evade the innate and adaptive immune systems is something called antigenic drift, and it was shown in a 2012 study that mutations in the highly variable globular head region of the hemagglutinin enables for the virus to not be neutralized as easily by neutralizing antibodies. So these mutations each year during flu season that like differ from year to year explains why there are new outbreaks of influenza each year since Different influenza mutants are presented to humans each year, which our immune systems don't recognize as being familiar. The treatments for bacterial pneumonia involve antibiotics, for example, for streptococcus pneumoniae, which is gram-positive. You would potentially use um, penicillin, since penicillin is made for gram-positive bacteria. Um, for bacterial and viral pneumonia, you could use over-the-counter pain relievers like ibuprofen to reduce fever and treat pain. For viral pneumonia, you can't use antibiotics because viruses are structurally different than bacteria. And for viral pneumonia, you could use different types of antivirals that are specific to the type of pathogen that you have been infected with. For example, for RSV, you could use ribavirin, also known as virazol. Um, which is an antiviral medication that is used to reduce the spread of the virus.